Hi everyone, thanks for having us. I'm Shannon, and this is Nathan. We, um, we both work at Rancher, excited to be here. Uh, this, is the, this is the third uh, Dynamic Infra Day, Container Days event that I've been to now. So the second in New York and I was in Boston earlier this year. And it's one of my favorite events of the year. It's a kind of a perfect size event, you know, kind of between the meetups that we do all the time, going out talking, just sort of talking about 30, 40, 50 people, and the big DockerCon, KubeCon, LinuxCon type of events where you talk to lots of people, but it's, it's pretty formal and the, and the agenda is very tight. This, this is a, I think this is a, you're, hopefully you're gonna have a great time as I always have at this because the whole point of the next few days is learn a lot, learn a lot of different things, uh, learn about a lot of new tools and new technology. Um, just a, a little bit of background on Shannon. I'm one of the founders at Rancher. Nathan is uh, one of our field engineers and leads our DevOps team. Um, we have uh, we've been talking about Docker now for over two years. We started Rancher back in the, in the fall of 2014. Just show of hands, how many people here are using Docker today in some context? Is it you know, containers in, in some context at all? Okay. Almost 100. Okay. How many people are running Docker uh, using an orchestration platform? Kubernetes, Swarm, Mesos, something. Okay, about 15%. How many people are using Docker in production? I'd say about, say about 20% or so. Um, how many people are using one of the vendors that are out there in the hallway? Sysdig, Portworx, Branch, or something that's out there? About half of people. It feels like we got a community, we've got an ecosystem. It's, start, it's, like, it's so much more real. Even earlier this year, we were in Boston, I kind of asked these same questions. Um, to start off the day, and I can say it was about half as much. And I really feel like this year was a huge turning point in terms of overall adoption. I mean, we certainly saw it in the, the rancher community, and I think talking to you know all my friends out on the hallway that I see all the time, they were saying the same things. I think Knox at Cystic told me we were in Berlin a couple weeks ago, and he was saying, it's crazy how much we're just seeing so many projects now. So many people are putting this stuff into production. So many people need monitoring. And, um, and that's exciting because you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about, we've been talking about for a couple of years, but it hasn't been very real. Now all of a sudden it feels incredibly real. So the, our first session today is, is really to kind of talk through that life cycle. Um, it's not really a story about Rancher, it's really more a story about just what we've been seeing over the last few years, and kind of how people progress from starting with Docker through you know, kind of understanding how to run their applications in more of a distributed way, all the way up to deploying orchestration, deploying more complex, multi, you know, master type applications, and dealing with issues like storage and monitoring and networking, and you know, kind of actually how to run this stuff in production. So we're going to try and touch touch on these things relatively briefly. Um, we generally hate presentations where we don't demo, so we're going to try and demo a lot. We have it in an hour, so we're going to demo three odd times, and we're kind of going to go through each of these demos and sort of show you a little bit about um, every step of the way. So we're gonna talk about pulling out, you know, just kind of how people are moving, at, you know, that first step. You're moving, you're starting to use Docker on your machine, now you start wanting to push uh, from code directly into a CI CD pipeline, automatic, automate your building of containers, and push it out to maybe a, a server. As you start dealing with that, you start wondering to push it out to lots of servers, and start dealing with clustering, start dealing with orchestration, start dealing with logging and monitoring, so we'll kind of build out a bit more of a cluster, build out an environment, you know, deploy, you know, Prometheus, or since I'm not sure what we'll deploy, throw out some monitoring tools, and then eventually we'll kind of look at, at a more complex application. How do you start deploying databases? How do you deal with some of the concepts around storage, persistence? Um, you know, what do you do when things that need to do leader election? How do you deal with more complex things? So we're gonna kind of go through, Nathan and I will be demoing three times. We, we run meetups every month online, and Demos break all the time. So we do this stuff live, there's no canned videos. So if stuff kind of goes wrong, we'll, uh, we'll try to recover it. If we can't, we'll say what it should have done and we'll just keep it. So um, if you want to see anything that we can't show you now, swing by later or come watch a video or something. <laughs> so our goal today though is really to kind of define what does a production Docker service look like, a production container service, because it really ties together um, a lot of different things. I sort of feel like in a couple years from now, there will be jobs called container ops or something where effectively you have teams whose job is, in the same way you see these cloud ops jobs, basically just container ops. They're dealing with infrastructure, they're dealing with 
the life cycle of building and packaging software, uh, upgrading, of maintaining, of monitoring software, and, and a lot of what we do is really going to be focused on this process. We're going to talk about the life cycle of, of developers and how people tend to get started with Docker, all the way through to running this stuff in production and what that looks like. Um, each step of these things, you know, there are very interesting tools. We're going to be talking about a lot of tools today. Um, almost all of them are open source, or they're SaaS services, or they're sources you can very easily get your hands on. And um, we'll, we'll be talking about those. So if you have questions about some of these tools, you can raise your hand. I'll, I'll explain them more if I kind of feel lost quickly over what something is, and you're curious what it is. I, I'm not going to talk about anything that probably a lot of people in the room couldn't tell you what it is. So feel free to ask anyone. They'll probably be able to answer a question on it. The, um, the fun part of Docker is usually the beginning. I think when people get started with Docker, it's pretty exciting. The first couple years, maybe for a couple months, maybe, it, when you start deploying for the first time on your laptop and see that you can build out a very complex application, lots of different services um, connected as a single stack that you can define in a compose file or a YAML file, something to, to bring up and deploy. It's pretty awesome. And I think a lot of people start here. They start with the idea of, you know, hey, this could really help our business, this could help our team. This this idea of, of you know putting applications into containers to both test it better or to move it around better, to share it better with people in their organization. And so, you know, pretty often this is this is the starting point. It's a single person, it's a single part of the organization that's working on it. And you know, often it's just Docker. You know, maybe it's Docker for Mac, maybe it's uh, you know, Docker running on their local machine that tends to be the starting point. And um, one of the things I'm going to try and just highlight some of the sessions that are coming up. Andrew and I did this at every conference. It just there's, we're going to have sessions on all of these topics. So there's a great session this afternoon at one o'clock um, from Casey and Pivotal diving into you know, building your containers the right way because there's a lot of complexity. The more you start to build these things, the more you realize what's good to put in there, what's not. How do you take existing official images out of Docker Hub and maybe add your configuration into sidekicks or, or pod you know, mates that can kind of put together to drive the configuration you want without necessarily having to go build all these containers for yourself. So definitely, even people who maybe gotten a little bit of expertise on building containers, highly recommend this session. Get deeper into the weeds. This stuff is, is relatively complex. The more you do it, there's a lot of backtrack. Like I said, this is the A-level masters in, uh, you know, in, in containers and building those your, your Docker files and building your your actual container images. Um, but you know what typically happens is once someone goes from, I love this on my laptop, I love the impact the container can have for me personally or for me and my team, they all of a sudden want to use it everywhere. And this tends to be where you know the complexity starts to rise. And you can imagine the life cycle I showed on that first slide, it's a steady rise in complexity and a lot more likelihood that things start to you know get hairy. Um, you know, the first couple pieces of technology that get pulled in for most people are, you know, they start thinking about how they can build these containers, at, you know, as code. So they'll start using CI, CD tools. Um, you know, we use Drone every day in our team. I know lots of people that use Jenkins and Travis and Go, and, and there's just there's tons of great CI, CD tools. They're all used now to build in containers. They're all used to manage the build of containers. So, um, you know, this, will, this is usually one of the first tools you'll start to connect to your container workflows. And the output of that is always, almost always at least, some kind of a registry. So either an existing registry that you might have, like Artifactory or Nexus, or to a hosted registry like Quay or Docker Hub, or even just to a self-run <coughs> private Docker registry. Really easy. Lots of ways to spin these up. There's tons of great things. The, the list of features that you can get into at this level is, is getting really impressive in terms of security, especially. A lot of these registries now can look for vulnerabilities, can tell you, hey, you know, what what do you want or what do you want to allow in terms of how people can build things. But it's really this. And to be honest with you, most of the time, I would say at least half the time when, when I first meet someone who's been using containers and they started to provision, they kind of hit this point, they're doing all their provisioning, or most of their provisioning with, with Chef, or they're using Ansible, or they're using Puppet, or they're using some type of automation tool they already have to just call Docker's API and locally just say spin this up. And that's a pretty useful way. I mean, depending on what you're trying to do, I think that's probably enough for a lot of great use cases. I mean, I think a lot of people over-orchestrate. You know, if you're just deploying half a dozen containers on a couple servers, 
you know, do the simplest thing that works and is repeatable and then move on. You know, obviously there's some limitations you'll get to and, and there are advantages of tools like Kubernetes and, and Swarm and other management tools, but this is a pretty typical thing. So what we're gonna start with from a demo point, we're just gonna kind of show how this happens and kind of go through building out uh, an environment connecting to Jenkins, connecting to GitHub, you know, launching a couple applications and give you a, a, a full idea. So Nathan, you have your laptops fired up? You can plug in here whenever you're ready. Kind of show how it goes. Are you on? I am now. How's the volume? Good? Yeah. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Nathan. Good morning. So as um, Shannon mentioned, what I'm gonna show you, uh, based on hands earlier, Probably something that a lot of you have in place already, but we have a little toy app uh, that is deployed through a, not, not just the app, but the, the containers infrastructure around the app um, through a Jenkins pipeline. So, um, we'll get to Rancher here. And what we'll see in a second, Wi-Fi Willie, is uh, our, we'll have, um, Three environments, we'll have a Jenkins instance, we'll have our, um, basically our messaging app, and we will have um, the Jenkins worker nodes. Okay, good. No DNS attacks this morning. Great, so there we go. Uh, those are, at the top we have our, our primary Jenkins instance and then with our, our worker nodes, or the Swarm clients. And then uh, there's our, the orchestration uh, stack there is our toy app. So we can kind of look. And uh, nothing too fancy there. We've got a load balancer and Nginx behind the load balancer and then a small Postgres database. So let's go look at this thing. So it's kind of kind of Twitter like. The problem, uh, perhaps, being that we're going to use this for the conference, and uh, right now Acme Company is a little bit too generic, so we want to modify this thing uh, so that it can be used for the conference. Um, I'm not going to pop up Eclipse or Emacs or anything too fancy. We're just going to stick with BI today. Might make more sense. That should be a little bit easier to read. Okay, so uh, here's our application, a uh, little Flask app, and what I'm going to do is go and modify the index. Perhaps, uh, let's see, instead of Acme Company, I just lost my mouse, or my pointer. That's better. Uh, we'll modify this thing so that it's a little bit more appropriate for this conference. Before I push this, once I push this, the pipeline goes into motion and the root Goldberg machine fires up. So before I do that, uh, instead what I'm going to do is go over here and get a view of some of the things in our environment so that we can kind of see this in action. So let's see, first, let's pull up Jenkins and look at our pipeline. And I think it's fun to watch graph view of these things when you update them. So we'll bring that up, We're ready for that. And uh, no job yet, okay. So 
So uh, basically what I'm doing here is I'm pushing the commit that I just made up to GitHub, or at least I'm trying to. Scheduling becomes the challenge. 
orchestration becomes a challenge. And you know, very quickly, I think people realize that you know they're going to be running containers against clusters of infrastructure. And these clusters of infrastructure um, run a lot better when you deploy some type of an orchestration tool against them, whether it's 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 you know it's it's warm and it's directly out of Docker or it's Kubernetes or it's Mesos. And I'm sure at some point we'll have a, a working session today to look at comparing these things and people <coughs> talk about why they like their choice. Um, they're all great. I mean, honestly, as someone who uses all of them and works with companies who use all of them, they're very similar. You know, I think sometimes that we, we overstate how different they are. And there's a lot of um, a lot of contention at the moment in the space between these tools. The reality is they're all kind of heading in the same direction. So you know, where one may be ahead of another at a certain point in time, they tend to be going in the same direction. You know, somebody may be um, have the right features for what you're trying to do. I think that's the important thing. Just look at what you need and what level of complexity makes sense for the for your team to manage. Um, but this will be, I think, at least for the next year, this will be a hot topic. What type of orchestration to choose? And uh, you know, I'm certainly happy to, to run a session and talk. I did it in Boston. We just sat down and looked at all these, talked about some strengths, talked about. And we had like 40 people in the room sharing their experience. In fact, just show of hands here, how many people are using? One of these tools, I saw a bunch of orchestration people. So, how many people are using Kubernetes? Okay, how many people are using Swarm? How many people are using Mesos? So it's pretty typical. I think that, you know Kubernetes seems to be slightly more popular right now when I talk to users, but it's not overwhelming. I think you see kind of a similar ratio, maybe 40, 30, 30, or 50, 25, 25, something like that. So. Very successful deployments on all of these platforms. I don't think you're going to fail by choosing one of these. I also don't necessarily think this is a space where you're going to have one winner, where the whole market is, oh, we've all chosen Kubernetes. It's the best way to do everything, and therefore, there's no need for other tools. Um, I, I, I have two or three people we work with that love Nomad and, and swear that it's, it, you know, the HashiCorp project for scheduling is, is great. It's exactly what you need. It works really well with Terraform and the other tools that use from HashiCorp. I think there's going to be possibly even more competition. And, more things. One of the things that could very well likely happen is, as these, you know, as these schedules get more and more complex, um, there starts to be demand for simpler tools. You can almost see something happening like with configuration management, where as Chef and Puppet got more and more and more robust, all of a sudden there's demand for Ansible and for you know, sort of rethinking it two years later. So, I'm feeling the scheduling. The scheduling is. If anybody's been working in technology for a while, I'm getting older now. You know, scheduling's been around forever. Schedulers are at the heart of OpenStack. They're at the heart of clouds. They're at the heart of VMware. <laughs> This isn't a new concept, how we schedule resources. Uh, imagine how much more complicated scheduling is going to be when we have live migration of containers, probably not a year away. I think you'll, you'll see that this year, 20, 2017. So if you're thinking about next year, you know, I wouldn't worry as much about this maybe as some people do, picking the right thing. So, but what is important is as you use these tools, make sure they work well with your goals. So if you're going to be spinning up you know, a lot of containers and you know, one of the most important pieces of it is how do you describe those applications? You know, the, the, the Docker Compose file, the YAML file, the, the tool that describes your application allows you to, you know, kind of see and understand the relationships. You start to deal with health checks, service discovery, you know, load balancer configuration. These are the kind of things that you do that, that become really important. In fact, the more complex your application is, the more dependencies it has, the more pressure you're going to put on your scheduler to deal with, you know, monitoring the health of your application in different ways with uh, recovering from failure, with allowing your you know, components to find one another, with dealing with some data, you know, some services that require perpetual or per persistent data and others that don't. So there's, you know, the more complexity you have, you probably do need more complexity and capability in your scheduler. So they, they, they're, they're definitely not all the same. They do have different capabilities. Um, we're gonna have lots of talks on this. Um, Francisco, who I've known for a long time, is giving a, a very good conversation at at 1, 11.30 right after this on how the New York Times is dealing with this and some of the work they're doing with Sumeru. Um, there's also a good conversation, I think, tomorrow uh, from Arbor, where they're going to talk about using Kubernetes quite a bit. They're using GCE, and they'll dive into using Kubernetes, I think, in quite a bit of detail. Um, I was surprised we don't really have like an intro course on, on Kubernetes or Mesos. So hopefully, if people want to really get their hands dirty, given all the hands and users around here, if you have a lot of knowledge, you've been running this for a while, Please propose a talk. I know people would like to sit and learn from someone who's actually running Kubernetes in production, Mesos in production. That's why this is such a great conference. So the other half of starting to run clusters is infrastructure challenges. Because when you begin to you know, pool together your clusters and you're dealing now with multiple hosts, um, you actually need to start laying down 
infrastructure services. And, and infrastructure services can be natively part of the orchestration stack, or they can be an external extension to the orchestration stack. There's lots of different approaches to this. But the key things are, you need to make sure that your containers are getting their own IPs effectively. They're going to be able to live on their own on some type of an overlay network that exists within that cluster. So you need to start thinking about your containers almost like you think about virtual machines in the sense of they're all going to be deployed out. They're going to have relationships to other services. Um, service discovery becomes really critical, whether you're running out as an external service with console or you're leveraging the native service discovery that already exists in some of these container orchestration stacks. Um, you want to be able to do that. Load balancing becomes you know, incredibly important. And again, you realize pretty quickly, what, what are we doing inside this container? We're just recreating you know, Amazon, effectively. <laughs> what are we recreating? All of the tools that we use today in VMware or in bare metal, right? We need, we need a network to connect the containers. We need to figure out how to load balance them. We need them to be able to discover each other. Um, ideally, if we already have tools in these areas, we may want to use those. So if we're using F5, you may want to have drivers that talk to F5 and tell F5, hey, this service is the one I want to expose. Here's where it's located. And those capabilities are appearing as microservices. They're appearing as capabilities in tools like Rancher, where it understands, oh, I'm using F5, so go update F5, or go update 353 every time you know a server gets added and one more of my container load balancers gets created or something. So more complexity, more hosts. Um, I think there's a, there's a good conversation tomorrow that I wanted to call out as well that is about Prometheus and talking about monitoring with Prometheus that uh, Tobias is giving from, from SoundCloud. As you get into this complexity, you can imagine the type of monitoring you need to do. It's not just about you know, pulling container stats and host stats. You really do need to understand, you know, is the network performing? Is the overlay network performing? Can I detect what's happening in here? Do I understand what's actually going on? Where are the bottlenecks? We use Weave Scope sometimes. It's a really cool project from the Weave team that lets you track packets and really understand in these overlay networks what's going on. So a lot of great tools. So Nathan, how are you feeling about your network? Better. Better, okay. So it's getting harder. The demo, this demo is much more complex. Now we're going to spin up. Yeah. Um, we're going to go and we're going to spin up a bunch of services. We're going to try and deploy an help stack. We're going to try and spin up Prometheus. Um, ideally, we're going to be monitoring the app you deployed before. But since it didn't get up, I don't know if you've got it now fired away. Yeah, I'm still having trouble getting the uh, GitHub, but that's okay. We can proceed on to the monitoring one. All right, let's hope that GitHub. The last, uh, I was in Berlin a couple weeks ago. I used GitHub, I used GitHub for a lot of my off. It was all down for about a, a day. And it was for, and yeah. it about three hours. It was brutal. Okay, let's hope that we're fired away. You ready to go? Yep. Okay, so you're going to be demoing, showing how to basically build a cluster um, and start deploying some, some orchestrated applications. Yeah, so uh, the second intended demo, uh, in this case the first demo, um, was to talk about once you have containerized your applications, uh, well, congratulations, because most of your debugging and logging uh, techniques from previous experience are uh, somewhat limited. And so it helps to um, deploy some newer, um, newer monitoring and metric visualization tools and so on and so forth that are a little bit more oriented towards these type of workflows. Uh, GitHub is up. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so I have a, another rancher environment over here that we'll log into. And this one does not rely. Okay, so uh, we have another uh, rancher environment with another Jenkins instance, um, and it's uh, associated worker nodes. And then we have this little kitten to blog, which is something I kind of threw out there to be silly. Um, these applications are now running in a containerized environment. Uh, if something goes wrong with them, well, you can go to the rancher console, you can go to the containers and view log there. Maybe you could, uh, looking at the infrastructure, Maybe you could SSH into one of the hosts and do some Docker log stuff, but uh, it's a little bit limited. Um, and if you have you know, 20 or 30 of these, um, these agent nodes in your environment, and then tracking down where the container is running, uh, and then making sure that you have credentials to SSH in, it's just a bad workflow. It's just not optimal at all. So what I'm going to show you here are, are some tools. Actually, let's look at the apps first. This is just a little WordPress blog. For our kittens. Um, and then in Jenkins, we have 
maybe it, maybe it thinks running uh, just fine, but you would still like to get a little bit more visibility um, into what's going on in the infrastructure. So I had this Jenkins job that had been running for quite some time, and they're all green because my code is always perfect, unlike my demos. Um, I just kind of would like to know better the kind of state of the overall uh, infrastructure and the overall stack. So, how many people are using Prometheus or have heard of Prometheus? This is a really great tool for metric visualization. Prometheus, if I can spell it. Not a great sci fi movie, but a uh, nice piece of software. So using the Rancher um, catalog templates, uh, we're now blowing out a Prometheus uh, infrastructure that we can use to get performance metric for our Jenkins instance and our WordPress instance. Did you show the Docker compose file and just kind of explain a little bit about what goes into launching something as complex? Oh uh, yeah, sure. So we can actually uh, go over and look at the configuration of the service as it's spinning. And uh, this is scaffolding with the Rancher Compose, so where we feed in input variables and stuff like that, but it ends up generating a Docker Compose file. So you can get a little bit of information about how this thing is configured. Um, you do all this with templates, uh, and then maybe uh, the inputs can be fed into the CLI or whatever tool you're using to actually spin the infrastructure through the UI if you feed some of these things in with our Rancher CLI. Uh, that can all be version control, which I'm a big fan of. I'm sure you probably are as well. So there's a, oh, that's a fun one, look at that. So there's the graph for our Prometheus infrastructure, all the different containers, all the different pieces that go into this. Um, this guy is all green, so it looks like he's running now. So let's go back to our user stacks, and we should be able to, there's Grafana. So well, let's just get some performance information about the. Not a whole lot that's interesting about the containers right now. About our hosts, fairly low load on our hosts because that Jenkins uh, pipeline is pretty lightweight. But anyway, uh, so just with a few clicks now, we've got the ability to do some uh, time series data, do some metrics collection, visualization, that kind of stuff. Um, that's all great. Uh, sometimes logs are more useful than the visualization um, as you dig into a problem. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, how many people are familiar with deployment of the Elk stack? Yeah? Okay. Uh, a little tricky sometimes. But we've got templates for that stuff, so it makes it a bit easier. So I'm going to first deploy um, Elasticsearch, and this is kind of like the storage layer. All of our logs are going to end up in the, in this layer. So we'll see that come online. Um, as soon as that one is online, I'm going to uh, quickly deploy uh, Logstash and Logspell. So if you're not familiar with that stack, Logstash will basically be, it has this concept of a collector, that's where the log data goes, and then it injects that data into uh, Elasticsearch. And then Logspout is a piece of software that is gonna run on each of the rancher agent nodes to extract syslog, JSON logs from the Docker containers and pass that to Logstash, which then passes that to Elasticsearch so that it's searchable, right? May take a second because I think we have to pull some containers down. Nathan, can you talk through just one link to that? Um, you know, the idea behind you know, catalogs, private catalogs, and just sort of how people are you know, kind of managing the life cycle of your compose files, your replication controllers, or you know, your YAML files for Kubernetes. Sure. Thanks. So um, looking at, if we just go and look at the catalog here, what we see are there's a whole series of, um, some written by the community, some written by Rancher Labs, a whole series of applications that um, sort of the templated deployment of has been captured um, in what we call our catalog templates. And there's actually, if I can get to it. <coughs> um, I'm sure. There we go. 
Um, there's a repo out on GitHub where uh, all of these templates live. And you'll, if, you, if you're looking closely, you'll see that uh, there's also the, the Kubernetes and Nexos and Swarm templates uh, live in this repository as well. So you can make modifications locally, and if you want to submit it to the community, then you can send a pull request in against this. Uh, if you wanted to keep your catalog templates private, then you have a repo that's structured roughly uh, in this fashion, and there's, there's some stuff on the blog, on our blog, that tells you how to do that. And then you can go to your Rancher server and you can actually plug it in. Oh, yep, uh, so this is our demo environment. I actually don't have the permissions to do this. But there would be an admin drop down there and you can go and you can add uh, repositories. So you point the Rancher server at your GitHub repository and then it will populate that list of catalog. Um, the list of catalogs from your repository, and like this OpenStack here, and this private, uh, those are those are non-standard, right? Those are um, modifications that people have made to the demo environment um, since it was since it was stood up. So somebody obviously has an OpenStack template uh, there. Let's go back and look and see how our Elasticsearch is doing. So this is going to stand up um, Elasticsearch, it's going to stand up master, a client, and a data node, and then we should have a cop as well, so we can go and look at, there we go, we're green. We can look at the status of the Elasticsearch. Now there's nothing interesting, uh, there's nothing interesting going on here yet, because we haven't injected any data, so let's go do that. So I mentioned before, Logstash is how we get the good stuff in there. Take the latest version of that, and we're going to. This is uh, kind of a rancher construct, but we're going to we're going to tie Logstash to the Elasticsearch clients service, so that it knows where to send its data. Um, this one is uh, the graph for this one. I don't think is as exciting as some of the others. Yeah, it's not too bad. Um, all right. So we can see a little bit of information here about how Logstash is configured. The Reddit instance. Probably, if you look at the images. We have some custom images. We, we often do what's called a config container, and then we'll take an actual vendor container image, like if it's an Elasticsearch container image, and we'll deploy the, the official upstream Elasticsearch one, and then we'll have our config container that goes in and maybe maps a volume and, and messes with some config files before it fires up the, uh, the vendor or the official vendor container image. Okay, so we're good there. And now. which happens to be conveniently there at the beginning of the list. And we're going to tie this one to the collector, right? So we're injecting our data into the dash collector. Now this is actually, um, let's see if we can get to the infrastructure view really quickly. Should see then is a log spout container running on each of our worker nodes, each of our agent nodes. There's one, there's one, there's one. go back to Elasticsearch, we should then see that we have some indices, right? It's a little bit hard to see probably here in the back, but that's proof that Logstash is not injecting data into Elasticsearch. So that's great, now we're capturing the data, but we still need to see it. So one last. Good. 
good, good, and tie it to the Elasticsearch clients. Um, I did this for CM tooling. I used to work for one of the CM uh, companies, and uh, even if you have pretty good modules or cookbooks, uh, this can take a while and it can be error prone. Thank you. So basically, uh, the point of this is to show you that um, maybe if some of the old debugging and, and logging uh, techniques that you use with DM-based infrastructure, so on and so forth, isn't quite as effective. There are tools, and uh, because they are also containerized, they're actually pretty easy to stand up that will kind of fill gaps. And I, actually, I think a lot of these tools are better than some of the old techniques. So now if, uh, let's see if we want to do something specific about doing this, is it in there? Might not have, and might not have run anything yet um, to generate any logs. <coughs> but generally speaking, um, in a couple of minutes, we've got an ELK stack uh, with now some pretty advanced queries and some ability to do some pretty advanced correlation so that we can actually see the state of our The point of this is really to kind of give you an idea, you know, as you're moving up the complexity gap, you know, there's a lot of solutions to these problems from deploying uh, really great SaaS services to running your own implementation. But by and large, the, the thing you'll start to do as you're using orchestration of any kind is you're going to be building a lot of template files, you're going to be managing a lot of template files, you're going to be versioning a lot of template files. Um, you probably want to inject configuration into a lot of template files. So these types of you know, uh, whether it's Docker Compose or it's a, it's a Kubernetes, you're going to be managing a lot of that, and building your systems around that is going to help a lot. And as you build out these underlying tools, the monitoring, the networking, uh, the load balancing type of capabilities, uh, you'll be able to, you're going to have this requirement. I think this is the real reason that so many people that, you know, I think pretty good correlation of people, as they put this stuff into production, are running on some type of orchestration. It just gets pretty complicated. You can imagine sitting there, we had a four node cluster with, you know, probably about 70 containers that spun up in five minutes. Imagine this over the months and years of being in production. The complexity goes up. And it just goes up as you run a lot more complex applications. We were kind of taking a bunch of shortcuts there and using pre-built applications. But as you run, you know, your own custom applications, as you run more complex deployments, think about deploying uh, Kafka or, or Spark or setting up, you know, Kubernetes uh, itself, running OpenStack, these types of things people are doing. It was, you know, we have, um, I was watching the OpenStack conference in, in Barcelona remotely this year, and I think mean, four of the five first sessions were about people using containers to run their, you know, run their actual OpenStack implementation. It was a big trend. But as you get dug into it, the complexity is enormous, right? You're starting to run very complex applications, very complex failure rules, lots of relationships between things. So um, you start to get into more of this stuff, and, and whether it's from doing things like you know, kind of starting to run a, a service like the catalog. The Nathan was showing you where you, you standardize your templates, you kind of inject configurations, you share them with your organization, or it's more just on a simple local level. You're dealing with you know, metadata, dealing with um, pods and replication controllers and sidekicks that are configuring other containers. Um, you're gonna you're gonna get to a point where the complexity just goes up, and so uh, you know, dealing with that, dealing with how containers interact with storage and how containers interact with external services is really kind of the next big step. And so we're, we're having a great conversation, um, I think it's today, yeah, no, tomorrow at 1135. In fact, 1135 is an unfortunate overlap. Both of these seem like such great sessions. I, I, I would really highly recommend you go to both of them. Vinod is from Portworks, a great company. They are gonna talk a little bit about persistent storage. They built a really awesome overlay storage service that, uh, 
just they just put it in the Rancher catalog, so I've been playing with it a lot the last couple weeks. Uh, but it basically implements block storage as a persistent containerized service. And think about what that means. That means wherever you spin up your infrastructure, you simply deploy something like Fortwork, and it consumes the local disk and turns it into an EBS-like service for your containers. Uh, now, how portable can your applications be? Your storage is portable, your container itself is portable, your network overlay is portable. Literally, you're, you're just getting from your cloud provider bare metal. All of a sudden, it's tools like, you know, platforms like Packet, they're saying, hey, we'll give you bare metal, we'll give you, you know, a great value on infrastructure on demand. They're really compelling because instead of having to necessarily take the entire stack from your cloud provider, you basically bundle it into your application and it moves with you. You know, we talked for, we've been talking for five years with cloud computing about hybrid cloud, and it's pretty much been a joke the whole time because as soon as you deploy to a cloud, you start to leverage its native services. But, you know, there's no reason to run an Amazon and not use EDS or not use ELB and not use RDS. But all of a sudden, with containers, you can make a really interesting case that your infrastructure services are as portable as your application stack. And that is very transformative. That starts to get to the whole concept behind you know, commodity computing, that applications can run anywhere identically and that whether I'm running in Packet, or I'm running in Google, or I'm running in Azure, or I'm running in Amazon, or I'm running on VMware, or I'm running on my laptop, the application will always perform the same way, the storage will be you know, implemented the same way, my backups will be pushed the same way to an object store. And, and that's, to me, that's the fundamental transformation that containers are offering. Um, the other big session that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of Vault, and uh, Jeff's gonna be talking from HashiCorp about using Vault very quickly, as you're containerizing things and as you're building these application stacks, you need to start thinking about how you manage secrets. Vault is a great way to do that. Um, it's by far the most popular thing that we use with our stuff on our own, with our users, and I, I highly recommend that session. So you're going to be torn. It's Rosemary's baby kind of choice. Right? Hopefully, it's all being recorded. You can watch one or the other when it's back. Um, we're out of time, I think, given all the stuff we're doing. We're going to show you a little bit more of a complex deployment of a Galera cluster. Or, um, or Kafka or something that has you know, persistent storage, requires leader election, and uh, you know, connects a lot of things. We'll, we'll put it up for something as a, an, a secondary session. But given all the other content, I think it's going to be an amazing couple days. I am happy to take a couple questions. I think we maybe have one minute, one or two minutes, if there are any. Otherwise, anybody have any questions? Awesome. Well, you are in store for a couple amazing days. So um, I don't know who is next.